There's this idea in Jungian psychology called the circumambulation. And Jung had this idea that you had a potential future self, which would be in potential everything that you could be. And that it manifests itself moment to moment in your present life by making you interested in things. And the things that you're interested in are the things that would guide you along the path that would lead you to maximal development. Now, it sounds like a metaphysical idea or a, or a mystical idea even, but, but it's not. It's, it's not. It's a really profoundly biological idea. The idea is something like, well, you're set up so that you're automatically interested in those things that would fully expand you as a well-adapted creature. Well, like... There's nothing radical about that idea. How else, what else could possibly be the case? Unless there's something fundamentally flawed about you, that is what the, the situation would be. It's kind of interesting to think about how that would be manifest moment to moment, but the idea is something like, well, your interest is captured by those things that lead you down the path of development. Well, that better be the case. Okay, so that's fine. And so there's some utility in pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's the call to adventure, let's say. Call to adventure takes you all sorts of places. Now the problem with the call to adventure is like what the hell do you know? You might be interested in things that are kind of warped and bent and often it's the case that when new parts of people manifest themselves and grip their interests say they do it very badly and shoddily and so you stumble around like an idiot when you try to do something new that's why the fool is the precursor to the savior from that from the symbolic perspectives, because you have to be a fool before you can be a master. And if you're not willing to be a fool, then you can't be a master. So, so you're gonna, it's, it's an error, <clears throat> error-ridden process. And that's also laid out in the Old Testament stories, because the first thing that happens to all these patriarchal figures when God kicks them out of their father's house when they're like 84, is that they, they run into all sorts of trouble, and some of it's social, and some of it's natural, and some of it's a consequence of their own moral inadequacy. So they're fools. And, but, but the thing that's so interesting is that despite the fact that they're fools, they're still supposed to go on the adventure, and that they're capable of learning enough as a consequence of moving forward on the adventure so that they straighten themselves out across time. And so it's something like this. This circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual We'll return to this, this continual circling, in some sense, of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, remember that for a second, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help, because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being it, you have to take it into account, fundamentally, and work with it. And so, and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny and you can assume that you're going to do it badly and that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up it's pretty easy to do it badly but the thing is it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all and that's the continual message that echoes through these historical stories in Genesis it's like these are flawed people they, they should have got the hell out of their house way before they did um, and they go out and they stumble around in tyranny and famine and self-betrayal and, and 
violence, and, but it's a hell of a lot better than just rotting away at home. And that's, the, that's great, so that's good. And so why is that? Well, okay, so you, you start your path and you think that you're heading you know, towards your star. And so you go in that direction. And then, because you're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location. Because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then you have to take a, you know, it's almost like 180 degree reversal. But it isn't because, you know, you've, I mean, you've gone this far and that's a long ways to get that far. But that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were waiting and so it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually because as you overshoot even if you don't learn what you should have done you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing and if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing then that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing so it's okay so it's like this now, what's cool about it, though, I think, is that as you progress, the degree of overshooting starts to decline, right? And that we know that. There's nothing hypothetical about that. As you learn a new skill, like even to play, to play a song on the piano, for example, you overshoot madly. You're making all sorts of mistakes to begin with, and then the mistakes, they, they disappear. There's a great TED Talk, I think it was, about this guy uh, set up a really advanced computational recording system in his home and recorded every single utterance his young child made while learning to speak. And then he put together the child's attempts to say certain phonemes and put them in the list and you can hear the child deviating madly to begin with and then after hundreds and hundreds of repetitions just zeroing right in on the exact phoneme. So, you know, I, you might not know this, but when kids babble, because they start babbling when they're quite young, they babble every human phoneme including all sorts of phonemes that adults can't say and then they they die into their language so that after they learn say English then there's all sorts of phonemes they can no longer hear or pronounce but to begin with it's all there which is really quite interesting but so they ze as they learn a particular language they zero in on the proper way to pronounce that and their errors minimize and every time you learn something that's how it is and that's really useful to know too because it means that it's okay to wander around stupidly before you fix your destination. Now you see that echoed in Exodus, right? Because what happens is that the Egyptians or the Hebrews escape a tyranny, which is kind of whatever you do personally and psychologically when you escape from your previous set of stupidly held and ignorant and stubborn axioms. It's like away from that tyranny. It's like, great, I freed myself from that. Well, then what? Well, you think, well, now I'm on the way. It's, no, you're not. Now you're in the desert where you wander around stupidly, you know, and worship the wrong things until you finally organize yourself morally again and head in the proper direction. So that's worth knowing, too, because you think, well, I got rid of a lot of things, baggage, excess baggage that I didn't need in my life, and now everything's okay. It's like, no, it's not. You've got rid of a whole set of scaffolds that were keeping you in place, even though they were pathological. Now you have nothing, and nothing actually turns out to be better than something pathological, but you're still stuck with the problem of nothing, and, and that's, well, that's exactly why Exodus is structured the way that it is. The fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean you have to stop. And thank God for that. That's a really useful thing. And the fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean that you can't learn. And so you can posit an ideal and you're going to be wrong about it, but it doesn't matter because what you're right about is positing the ideal and moving towards it. If the actual ideal isn't conceptualized perfectly, well, first, surprise, surprise, because like, what are you going to do that's perfect? So it doesn't matter that it's imperf imperfect. It just matters that you do it and that you move forward. So that's really, that's really positive news as far as I'm concerned, because you can actually do that, right? 